now I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, this afternoon, everyone be sure to bring your board because we want to continue working on this. I'm going to go through some topics today that I get the final exam has been written, it's been submitted, everything's been done. I put up that sample test. Now, today's lecture and Wednesday's lecture, during the lecture time, I'm going to be hitting topics that are definitely on the final exam. So, you know, it's one of those things that you need to make sure that you understand these last few lectures. I kind of joked around with the class during the regular semester last semester because uh, there's a tendency I noticed around here that students will attend their 80 percent of their lectures and then skip the last week or so and that's a foolish thing to do and the reason I say it's a foolish thing to do is if you're going to skip class and everybody every now and then has lazy days you don't feel like going to class I, I understand that I have a few of those days myself unfortunately since they pay me to be here I have to show up everybody knows if I don't show up to class up there but uh, the last week is really a week that you need to show up that's there uh, one of the questions that's going to be on the final exam deals with the time delay and as you recall we went through the time delay I wanted to kind of go through a little bit of that again with you here but there simply because if there and I put a link to this website here up there for this document up there I just posted I don't know it should be on Facebook this morning did, did anybody get the message this morning with the link that's there but uh, they talk about time delays here and one of the things here is there's an example here this says find the period of the of the final up there an instruction cycle really equates to you would divide by 12 in order to get the number of machine cycles from the the frequency so if you have a two megahertz a two megahertz clock right there a machine cycle would be your two megahertz divided by 12 right there and certain instructions require different numbers of machine cycles the only one that you really need to worry a great deal about is the and jump down through here is the jump not zero right here you see this jump not zero a jump not zero requires two machine cycles and the reason this is so important is that you're going to see see there find the time delay in the following following right there and the one you're going to see is the one from for example let me just pull up here right here and let me I need to bring up my calculator here uh, all apps bring up the calculator right here right here so if we put this in normal standard notation right here, we're all put in scientific, that if we have a two megahertz clock frequency, that's two megahertz right there, and we divide that by 16 equals 125 hertz right there. There's 125 kilohertz that's there. And you take one over X for that. And where's my one over X button on this thing here? It should have a one over X. Right there. Uh, yep. Where's my one over X? Oh, you know, I screwed that up. Your calculators have one over X keys, but uh, let's start over again. Two megahertz. Divide by... You know, let me go back to here go back to my example right here this discussion here is that you divide by 12 I divided by 16 divide by 12 right there 2 megahertz right there and you divide that by 12 right there and then you can take 1 over X for that right there and where's my one I don't have a 1 over X key Converter. This calculator is not as good as I thought it would be. 
Where is our 1 over x? We don't have 1 over x cubed. So let's just store that. Right there is a, is there a store. Scientific, let's go, let's go standard here. And the standard has a 1 over x key. Okay. That's where I, let's start over again. 2 megahertz. Divide by 12 equals right there. 1 over x right there. And if you do a 256 iteration times 256 equals times 256, here's 0.4 seconds is about basically what you would get. If you go back to our, let's find Blinky here. I think I have Blinky somewhere on this. Blinky ASM. I'm just going to open it with uh, Notepad for right now. And if you look at this right here, and I want to go through the timing on Blinky here a little bit because, again, that there, when we look at this particular instruction right here, <coughs> right here, you'll see that I load R5 with 0, 0, right? And then the next command after that is jump not zero, and I use the dollar sign. The dollar sign means it goes back to the same place. And by the way, you, you, you may want to remember that instruction. That's a big hint because you're going to see something that looks like this on the on the final exam. We spend a lot of time on blinking. So that means that we subtract one that goes to 255, and this keeps going around. So it's going to go 256 times that inner loop right there right there now if we look at this loop here we do the same thing we're moving zero zero into r6 and then we decrement not zero r6 and we loop back to, to loop zero so that's doing an inner loop so we do 256 times 256 times and that gave gives me back to my calculator right there right here because and where I got that number from and you might want to go through this right here is that the inner loop the, the clock frequency is 2 megahertz right there we divide that by 12 right here that's our machine frequency 166.666 kilohertz right there if we take 1 over X that's the number of that's the number of seconds it takes to execute one jump not zero. Right there. Well, we're going to do the inner loop 256 times. So we're at about 0 0.0015 seconds per inner loop. We do the inner that inner loop. We have the second loop. We do 256 times times 256 right there so that's 0.4 seconds so if we want a one second delay we, we're not going to get a one second delay the closest we're going to get is a 1.2 second delay we would do that three times and that gives us a 1.17 second delay if we divide that by three if we want say for example a five second delay how long would we have to do that and the easiest way to do that is divide this by 5 and hit the 1 over x. We have to do it about 13 times right there. So, again, you, you're going to need to know how to do this for one of the questions right there. So, let me repeat the process again. Is that when we look at the 8051, we look at the clock frequency and we divide that by 12 and that's the number of machine cycles that that there and let me let me write this out let me pull the pin out and let me write the procedure out real quick right here right 
right here, is we take our clock frequency, frequency, that's a, a G. In this case, we're saying it's two megahertz. Right there. I'll do another example where if I change the clock frequency. The machine cycle frequency, cycle frequency is equal to the clock divided by 12 right there. So as we look at, actually, actually I did that wrong. We're, we're off, I'm off a little bit that there. But we'll, we'll just look, look at, use that for right now. So that gives us there, because the jump knot zero requires two machine cycles. So I'm off by a factor two, I, I, I left that there. So the jump knot, decrement jump knot zero requires two machine cycles. right there. So we divide that by two again. So so again, jump increment not zero, right there. You know, that command, decrement jump not zero, means that we're going to execute this frequency divided by two. So I'm off by a factor of two. So my example is wrong that I did the first time. So, so I, good thing I'm going through this again. So as we look at this right here, right there, it requires two machine cycles. So we take the machine cycle frequency and we divide that by two again right there. And the reason I say that it requires two machine cycles is going back to this document right here. Right here right there you can, there's a table in this document you do not need to memorize all of them but there's a table that says a move takes one machine cycle a no op takes one machine cycle a jump not zero takes two machine cycles there's a table toward the end of this that lists all the various instructions and how many machine cycles we take i probably already passed it. it's probably up further Right here, where is it? Oh, you know, it's not. No, that was somewhere else I had the table. All right, you don't need the table. This, this example here does it right here. <coughs> right here. <coughs> so this tells us right here that we have a time delay. If you look at this example right here, we have 200, and I can't write on this here, but it, let me just use this here. If you look at this particular example, this is a good one right here. See, we, we, we do 200 in here and we decrement not zero and we just jump, stay right here, right there. So our time delay is 200 times two plus one plus two. These, or this is a divide by, or plus two right here. Those two we can ignore typically. Because the 200 is the ball coming right there, right here. So again, when we look at this jump not zero in this particular case, right here, find that if the crystal is 11.0592 megahertz right there, find the delay in the program right here. So when we do this right here, they, the delay, since, since we're looking at 11.92 frequency, 11 point, what was that frequency? Right here, 11 point, uh, oh, here it is, okay. 11 point, zero. And, oh. Eleven point zero five, and let me clear this. Eleven zero five nine two zero, and that's not right either. 
No, that's right. Zero, five, nine, two, and then I put another zero to put that in the megahertz right there. So that, that there. We divide that by 12 right there. And then we divide that by two again right there. And then we take the one over X. And that gets a different number than what we've got here. Because find the delay crystal. Yeah, four four point three two. What 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 have we got? This is not making sense here. There. 200 machine cycle. Oh, okay. The, 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 I, I see what they've done here is they multiplied it by two here to get that result right there. So, so let's go back to my calculations right there. So, so let's do a clear here. Let's take our 11.50920. And that's right, right. Eleven zero five nine two zero five nine two zero. We divide that by twelve equals one over x. That that's our that's our machine cycle delay right there. So then we're going to take that times two hundred right there and there's our delay right there times two okay right there and that comes close to our delay right there four four and thirty six nanoseconds microseconds all right let me let's go back and restart this process again right there and we'll do it the way that they do it here and the way that they do it here is that we okay let's start over again new page our clock frequency is And, oh, I keep forgetting to change batteries here. So our clock frequency is 2 megahertz. We divide that by 12 equals. Two megahertz divided by twelve equals one point sixteen hundred one over x. So that looks like I don't know why we don't have a one over x key here. Scientific calculator does not have a one over x key. That makes life interesting. Fortunately, you have real calculators, right? Yep, so a standard calculator has one over X key, the normal one doesn't. So, all right, two megahertz, divide by 12 equals one over X. So that, that's our time delay for for one machine cycle right there. Point zero 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 six so, looks like five zeros and a six right there. That's our time delay for one machine cycle. That's our time delay for one machine cycle. So if we're going to have two hundred and fifty six jump knob zeros, we would take that times two 
times 256. That's our inner loop. Our outer loop is another 256. So there's our time for the inner loop right there, our most inner loop using this, this example right there. So if we want to do 1.5 seconds, we do it twice. If we want to do five seconds, so this is how long it takes to do the inner loop. Now, as it turns out, different processors have different machine cycles per instructions, so this doesn't necessarily work for every processor. But for the case of the exam, you assume two machine cycles for the jump, not zero. So going back to our discussion right there, this is 16 hertz right there, right there. So one over this 1666 was our 0 0.00006 seconds for one machine cycle right there. This is one machine cycle right there. That's one machine cycle right there. So if we have a move R500, there's a number sign there, immediate, and we have a jump, not decrement jump, jump, not zero, jump, not zero, R5 dollar sign. That means we're going to jump that there. This means that this is going to do this 256 times, right? Times right there. 256 times that there. And each machine cycle is two times right there. So if we do that, each one of these inner loops, we're going to take this 256 times two times 256 right there. So this inner loop is going to be 256 times two times 0 0.00006 seconds right there. If we do that within another loop, in other words, we have this loop inside of another move R600, right here, and then we have a jump not zero, jump or decrement, decrement jump not zero, and we jump back to here, R6, right there, and we'll say loop one right here, loop one right there means we're going to go back this spot right here. Actually, we go we right there to the one above it is where we would do, do that there. Go back to Pointy here, right here. You see, we, we're jumping here back to R0 right there. Here, we're, we're doing the jump not zero back to here, right there. And then this one here, we drop out here. So we do 256 times 256. We've got one loop here. This is, this is one loop, 256. And then this here forms the other loop right here. This forms the inner loop right there. We got this, these two lines here form the most inner loop, that's 256. This here forms a loop that does 256. So it's 256 times 256. And then this here means that we're going to do the outer loop or those two, those two inner loops six times. So that would give you an idea of what the delay is right there. So again, you'll have to know how to work through that there. This, look at this website, wherever I put the website, right here. And it's got several examples on that right there. But you're gonna see that in conjunction with with blank, you know this code, this type of code right here, where you're going to see this particular, and you're going to have to be able to change the time delay 
And we did that in that first lab. And I went through the calculations in the first lab. I'm just reviewing it because, because, because it is on the final exam. <laughs> Not there, or you're going to have to there. So you're going to have to know how this time delay function works. That's there. So again, quick quick review is we take our clock, divide by 12 is our machine cycle frequency. You take one over the machine cycle frequency. That's the time for one machine cycle right there and you look at the loop size loops size and you take that times two right there because it takes two machine cycles and that's the delay for one loop right there or inner loop inner loop right there and then you take the time for the inner loop inner loop times there that's the that's the uh, loop size yeah times the loop size of the outer loop and that's then gives you the delay for the nested loop you know that these are loops there and then if you have an if that's nested even further you would multiply it again so if i have two loops i have an inner loop of 256 times an, an, another inner loop of 256 times six right there for the most outer loop that gives me my total time delay and that's all multiply times two that's the instruction cycle or number of machine machine cycles in one in jump decrement jump not zero so you double that times two times the time for the machine cycle time right there this is the formula that you would look at, you look at it on blinky right there right there that's the fo ultimate formula that you need to look at right there so as we look back at this right here, our example, our example here, this is this is 256. This is 256 right here. And then this one here is six. Right there. That's where I get 256 times 256 times six. Right there. Our machine cycle is 2 megahertz divided by 12. 12 is a magic number. It's designed as part of the microcontroller. So you need to remember that. A jump not zero requires two machine cycles. So you would use the two machines. That's there. So what you'll probably be asked to do, and I say probably after I've written it already, is you'll be asked to modify that six that get a particular amount of time delay right there. So you have to be able to calculate the inner loops that there. All right, that's enough on that subject that there. I just wanted to make sure I reviewed it because it's probably something that I would catch everybody on because you probably forgot that from the third or fourth, second or third week of the class that there. But I did go through it that there. Okay. I'm going to go through some slides here, hopefully that they're right there. And I'm going to go through, and I'm only going to hit highlights of that. Other than that, there are some more directives right there. And I'm not going to, I'm only going to hit the ones that are relevant to our project here. But well, I'm going to probably go through all of them, but I'm not going to go through them in great detail. I've got two sets of slides I want to go through today, right there. All right, some more directives. We've already used a few of those, and I just want to kind of point out what they are. That there, these 
they're not codes. They're, they're things that we tell the assembler on where to put things in our code out there and define various things right there. This is the process that happens, and we really haven't talked about this process, but when we write code, we write the we write the assembly language code. It goes through the assembler, it creates what's op, called object code, and then it goes through the linker that links various parts. This is a first semester course. Our programs are very simple. All of our files fit, in, all of our code fits in one file. So the linker can often link code from various sources. It's not unusual for a real project to write some of the project in assembly language and some of it in C. Matter of fact, quite often you'll write most of it in C and just little pieces of an assembler that have to be an assembler. And then you would call those functions between the two programs that's there. We haven't got into that there. But the output of the compiler and the assembler is essentially the same thing. Object code means that it's those op codes that we didn't talk about. In other words, move is F5, really. that's there. You know, every instruction has an op code that's there. So the, the output of the C compiler and the assembler is the, are the, basically the same thing. The assembly language, you have more control, and you can actually hand generate the, the object code by hand. And back in the early days of programming, that's how we did it. We would actually do the assembly by hand. The C compiler actually converts it to assembly language and then converts it into object code right there. So it's linked and it ends up in machine code and that's what's downloaded into our board. So we, what these assembler directions do is it tells the assembler how to generate the op code right there. They're not assembly language. They don't generate any machine code, but they instruct the assembler on how to do its job right there. We have multiple ones that we look at. I'm just going to kind of go through these briefly. There's not anything on the final exam on this, but I, I need to go through through that bit there. So I so if you want to if you want to turn off your mind and not learn anything, which is not a good thing, but that's there. But when you study the final exam, don't spend time on on, on this part of the lecture <laughs> right there. But it, it is valuable information if you're going to write code right there. We've used some of these right there. The X51, you can set up a function definition in code memory, an array. You can two types of segments based on whether you can write the, write these things as generic or relocatable, or you can write them as absolute. You can give them you can give it the specific address of where you want things to go, or you can just let the assembler put it wherever it wants to put it. Ninety percent of the time, we leave the assembler put the things where we want right there. And each of the two types of segments can be specified in one of the following five memory classes. The, again, the most common one is code and data and X data. Those are the three that we would use more than any place else. But we have I data and XB data or bit data right there, where we can define things as bits right there. That's there. So typically, we've seen this already in Blinky. If I bring Blinky back up here, did I close Blinky? Right there. If I bring Blinky, oh, excuse me. Oh, evidently I closed Blinky. That's there. You know, let me bring it back up again. Open with. Notepad. If we look at Blinky, see we set up Blink in the code segment right there. Right there. So we've already seen right there my data. This is setting up in the data segment. In other words, we're setting up something in data right there with memory class data right there. We, we have not done anything with the data segment, nor we, will we have much time to do anything with the data segment. That's there. We can set up the R segment in, in my data right there. That's there. We can select segment there, and we can put the data in there. We can also specify 
specific addresses right there. So typically, and we'll look at an example of that there, I can see that my code segment is going to start at address 300 hex, which is we, as you, as you recall, looking at our code, or we can say our deep data segment is going to start at memory location 0, 0400 right there. We can give it specific addresses right there. We can use the org right there, org 30. And we can say here we're going to specify org 80, set the location there, and we can specify where we want things to be placed. Again, we're not going to be using that until you see an example of it. It's not going to necessarily make sense. And then the last one is the end right there. Symbols that right there, we're going to use the equate for that. We have, I use the equate multiple times. You know, in other words, LE, green LED at equate port 0 0.1, for example, right there. And then we can also do that they're similar to define in macro. We could do additions and simple that there. Typically, we don't right there. A register contains right there. So we can, you know, there's examples of the equate. We've used the equate right there. So the equate, as you as we go back and we look at, oh, right there, we can see that we, this one doesn't, oh, yeah, right here is an equate right there. So we've used the equate the, right, right, right there. So, so again, all we're doing here, again, we're, we're setting right here. Here's again, we're, we're doing a seek in code segment at location zero. We have a long jump to main. When we put the code segment at zero, it means that we want that code to be at memory location zero, 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 zero in the code segment right there. And that's important in this particular case because that's the reset vector for the 8051. When we power this up, the first thing we want this thing to do is do a long jump to main right there. And main is defined down here, and that's right here. We have, it's in the code segment. We're going to switch to the R segment using zero. In other words, specify which register bank right there. And here's our code. So we do a long jump to main. Now we don't tell the compiler where to put main. Main can go anywhere in the code right there. As I recall, I put it at 300, you know, the default location. We, we could specify the location right there. The reason we don't, and this is, is important to keep in mind, the reason we don't just stick main at 0000, zero, zero, zero is because at the top of memory is all the inter, interrupt vectors where places are going, and we need to leave that space open. We really haven't looked much at that. We'll talk about interrupts in a few minutes here. But the interrupt vectors are at the top of memory, and they contain memory locations. So the interrupt vector for the reset is at location 0, 0, 0, 0. And so we just place in there the code that tells us to do a long jump to main right there. So right there. But there's our equate. Our set means that we're going to set a value as table times table. I'm not going to worry. I don't use the set very often. I've, I've never used the set, to be honest with you. I use equate a lot, but I don't use the set right there. So symbol, in other words, we can set up a symbol, and we can give it a bit address, code address. And again, these are format of directives where we can place data in certain locations right there. Again, this is not on the final, and I'm going through it, but you'll see this stuff on code when you when you look at it right there. So, in other words, ACT underscore bit 2E, use bit location 2E as the action bit right there. Port 0, port 2 is data, is use the special function register A0, which actually is equate to P2. With our assembler, because we include that 8051.inc, go back to main right here. 
right here. We do this include right here. Right there. Yeah, that's there. And what that file does is it defines things like P0.1 as a bit and its location. It defines all the ports. And this allows us to use names versus having to go back and look at this, you know, look at that, those special function registers. We can just use the name of the special function register and not do here. A0 happens to be, if we look at our special function register, the location of P2 right there. And I know what, I've gone through that table. I'm not going to go back and find that table now. But, you know, P2 is a location in the special function register as we went through on an earlier set of slides. And that location is A0. Because we use that, we include that C8051F850.inc, we can just say P2 right there. That's defined in that file. Now we can initialize memory. If we had a longer course and I could go much faster, we would be going through and setting up memory spaces. As a matter of fact, we would be doing, we'll, we'll probably do a little bit of that this afternoon when we look at the, um, our code for, for, for this, for the 216 uh, bit multiply. We'll be setting up some locations of memory to hold our data right there. These directors initialize and reserve the locations, and we can use a byte, a word, or a double word. We're doing 16-bit multiplication, so we're, we're going to use word, right there, words for that bit. Directive reserve memory with that is data segment right there. We'll reserve a special number of bytes in the current segment. That's all that says there. Label and expression. That there. So I can put label, you know, num1, data byte, lower byte, upper byte. Those types of things right there it can be a character string symbol. So we could that's where we could put our numbers, you know, store that in memory and not in the registers. Right there. Label is the starting address where the bytes are stored, and then it can be a character string or a bit constant right there. So that so we will probably use this in order to store our two numbers, do our do 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 our multiplication right there. Again. We can have a ASCII string defined right there. We can set up an array, define byte. This is in the code segment at location 200. So this is going to go in the code segment. And we're going to, in location 200, and then it's a message define, please enter your password. Right there. And the zero is the null character. That's how you end all strings right there. So that actually is going to set up a location starting at memory location 00, zero or 200 hex. And it's going to put the ASCII value of P, ASCII value of L all the way down through password D, the ASCII value, and then it's going to put a zero at the end of the string. So then we could go through it and write code to read that string and output it to a serial port or LCD display or something like that. So that's how we would put string, store strings in memory. Here we're storing five numbers, 10 through 50, multiples of 10, and we're storing those in memory locations starting at wherever array starts, right there. So this is array plus zero, array plus one, array plus two, array plus three, array plus four in the memory location, right there. Remember we talked about indirect addresses. So if we wanted to implement this, we would place the starting address of array in a register, and then we would offset it by whatever number we want. This is how we would access arrays in memory, right there. So, right there, the, the can only be used in the code, right there. <laughs> we can also set up, define words for 16 bits, right there. Again, this is how we store data in the code, in our code segment right there. Define double words, which is a 32-bit number, same type of thing there. Here, this last one is we're just defining three locations and we're putting zero, zero right there. We're just loading it with zero right there. We define storage, and this is in the data segment. It's usually used 
in the data in the data segment, but you can use it anywhere, right there. And we just define how many you know a locations all we're doing, right there. X segment and input reserve 16 bytes, reserve one byte, right there. So we're just setting up locations where we're going to call input, and we have 16 that 16 bytes reserved in this particular case. This is an external memory right there. See, it's the X segment, so it's an external data memory right there. Starting at address 1000, and we can store 16 bytes or one bytes right there. Right there. So, shoot, goodness. programmers should be aware that no more than 16 bit byte values starting at their example. Again, that's limited by the doing the, the memory offset. They're not initialized. They're, they're just reserved. So, the, so if you want to initialize them, you have to do that elsewhere. So this is just kind of an example here in a, up there. Equates carriage return is zero D. Oh, right here, we're saying a code segment. We do our long jump to main right there. Here we jump. We do an org. We do a jump to timer for interrupt vector. Right there, we, we actually do interrupt vectors up there. But again, if we were to look at the interrupt vector table, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes here on interrupts up there, we have to put our long jumps to our interrupt vectors right there, up there. And then here's our actual code and our data. We're reserving some starting location 30 in the data segment. This is now, now if it says my data segment data, that's the internal data. And remember, you could start that at 30, right there. So that's where, or 30, and we're reserving 17 locations, right there. 16 are input, up there, and then temp is one, right there. Here we have, in the code segment, we specify our register bank, zero, and we put in our, whatever our code is. And remember, on the previous slide, we had a long jump to main, it's good programming techniques to always use main as your starting routine, as your main, that's there. C requires that assemble does, assembler doesn't require it, but the linker is always going to look for something called main. And main is your, is where you start your code. In this particular case, we have an interrupt service routine that's there. We talked, we, we haven't talked much about interrupts, but we, at location, 83 is the interrupt service vector for timer four interrupt. In other words, when timer four overflows, it generates an interrupt. When that interrupt occurs, the compiler or the uh, processor is going to go to memory location 83 hex because that's the interrupt vector location for timer four interrupt. That's where its location is. And there we put a long jump to interrupt timer four interrupt routine. And here's where we service our timer, our interrupt right there. Here, we're, we're just setting up a, a table right there. This is, these are global constants right there. So we, we we just set right there. We have this memory location, and we can access that memory location right there. So that's it for that particular set of slides. And I have another set that I want to spend a little bit more time on. And slide from beginning right here. And that's interrupts. And interrupts will, there'll be some discussion on interrupts on the final. You won't have to write any interrupts, but you have to know what they are and what happens during interrupt right there. So let's first talk about what interrupts are, how they're organized, enable and disabling the priorities. We have a list of topics there. I haven't posted these slides, so I'll probably just post them up on the Facebook page here when I finish my discussion here, right there. I'm not going to post the, one, the previous set of slides because there's no questions on the final exam on that one. This one, there will be questions on the final exam on. So, an interrupt is the occurrence of a condition causes the program to stop what it's doing and do something else. An example of an interrupt would be you're pumping gasoline and you hit the emergency stop button on the gasoline pump. That is an interrupt right there. 
you're driving your car down the road and the temperature sensor goes over a certain level and it generates interrupt saying that you've overheated your car. That's assuming that you or software designed to handle what to do when when, when the car overheats. That's it. They are important because they allow the system to respond asynchronously to an event and deal with the event while in the middle of performing another task. They also give the system illusion of doing many things simultaneously. Know this slide. Know the two advantages of interrupts. I can't stress that enough <laughs> right there. I mean, I am just telling you right now that expect what are the advantages of interrupts or why do we use interrupts? Just expect that question to show up. And this slide is the answer to that question right there. You know, normally I don't coach people on final exams, but in this particular case, I'm going to go ahead and coach you right there that you need to know this slide right there. The subroutine, subprogram that deals with an interrupt is called the interrupt service routine or interrupt handler. Right there. So you need to know what is meant by an ISR, interrupt service routine. It handles the interrupt. You hit the emergency stop button on the gasoline pump, it's going to call a routine that's going to shut the pump off, right? Your car is overheating, it's going to call up a routine that's probably going to turn on the fan motor for if there's a fan on the radiator it's going to turn on the overheat light it's maybe disengage the air conditioner and some vehicles i've seen where it will disengage the in air conditioner in order to, to uh, you know reduce stress on you know stress on the engine various things will happen when when an interrupt occurs up there so this slide tells us basically why we use interrupts. They are important because they allow the system to respond immediately. You can use the word immediately to an event and deal with the event while it's doing something else. Now, while your gasoline pump is pumping gas and incrementing the dollar amount and incrementing that there, uh, someone hits that button, it stops doing everything and it shuts the pump off. And probably sounds a buzzer or something to tell what's going on at the emergency event there. So we, so an interrupt allows the system to respond immediately or asynchronously while it's doing something else to an event. It also gives the illusion that you're doing two things at the same time. That's there. So it allows the processor to go off and do something else while in the background it's monitoring these interrupt signals right there. The interrupt occurs, the processor stops what it's doing and it services the interrupt. When it's done servicing the interrupt, it will do a return from interrupt. That's there. The interrupt service routine ex executes in response to the interrupt and generally performs an input or output to the device. But the interrupt service routine does something to solve the problem. That's it. I look at the interrupt as, for example, a nurse working at a, at a hospital. That's there. And, you know, I only had experience as a day patient in a hospital in Malaysia. Out there, I haven't spent a lot of time in the hospitals, but I put an ex-wife through nursing school, so I know I know what nurses do on the job. As I used to bring lunch to her or dinner to her quite all, quite often. Out there, so I've spent time hanging around nursing patients. So I've never worked, at, and I and I did work in a in a hospital one time, but I was a psychiatric attendant. Out there, I had to deal with the uh, the Arangila. Out there, <laughs> so in my skill set is I know how to put a straitjacket on. That there. If anybody knows what a straitjacket is, that's the thing that they put on people where they hold the arms where they can't do anything. So I've learned how to put put those on the people when they're fighting. So that was part of my skill set at one point. That's there. So but so I understand. But if you look at a nurse sitting at a nurse's station, that's there. Yeah, you know, it's three in the morning, nothing's happening, the floor is quiet, all the supervisors are gone. So what is that nurse's typically doing. Uh, she's probably on her Facebook, you know, in today's era, maybe surfing the web. You know, American nurses tend to read sleazy female, you know, romance novels that's there. 
But you know, but they're doing everything but work, right? That's there. Yeah, that's there. All of a sudden, an alarm goes off on their desk, right? Something has happened in room 25. You know, they they have a say, for example, an, an infusion pump that pumps fluid into a person's arm with medicine, for example, and it, and it and it malfunctions. So it sounds an alarm on the nurse's station station right there. That's what an interrupt is do, does. It, it stops the processor from what it's doing. That nurse then has to stop whatever she's doing or he's doing. In Malaysia, I don't think I've seen too many male nurses. In the U.S., there's quite a few male nurses, but uh, that's there. But they're going to stop what they're doing, and they're going to perform some type of operation to service that routine. With a microprocessor, it's usually a device. With a nurse, it's usually a patient's room, a piece of equipment is malfunctioned, or a patient's just hit the call button and says, that, can you go down to the canteen and get me a sandwich? That's it. Whatever. So... That there. So when the interrupt occurs, the main program temporarily suspends execution. The nurse shuts down her Facebook page or minimizes it in most cases, right? That's there. Puts a bookmarker in the book. Hits the pause button on the YouTube video that he or she is watching. So basically, they stop what they're doing. And they go and they service that patient in that room. So... Yeah, interrupt service routine is the servicing the patient in that room. Performs desired operation. Upon finishing servicing that patient, they return from the interrupt. And they go back to what they were doing. The return is, and we'll talk a little bit how it differs from a normal ret return operation. But they're going to go back to where they were, were, were previously. Right there. Okay. This is important right there expect what happens when an interrupt occurs right there expect this question right there again this is why this last week is so important because i things that i that are on the final exam that i don't know if i covered properly i come back and recover or i make sure they are covered all right upon reset we execute our main code. Things are running normal. You know, you know, the nurse comes on the shift. They get the report from the previous nurse. They sit at their station. They they look at the charts for the various patients. They may make their round. That's there. Pass out all the data or drugs or medicine, whatever you call it here. That's there. But they pass out everything to the patients. That's there. And then at some point, an interrupt occurs right there the interrupt occurs at this point now when the interrupt occurs certain events happen right there now the first thing that's going to happen is we talked a little bit about the stack earlier the stack is a location of memory that is last in first out last in first out l-i-f-o l-i-f-o means last in first out I said that three times. There's a reason I said it three times. Hmm. Last in, first out. Things are pushed onto the stack. The stack operates in a last in, first out. Sometimes that first in, last, first out, or last out. The last in, first out, right there. So we push the programmer on program counter on the stack. Why do we push the program counter onto the stack? So we know where to go back to. And so we we are putting a bookmark in our book. So that's why I'm going to go back to our nurse. And we're going to assume that this is a nurse that likes to read romance novels. And I I, I don't know. Malaysian women don't read romance novels too much, do you? Malay novels? That there? It's not a book society. Read books, but American nurses read a lot of really rotten written. Romance novels, you know, the guy, the nurse, you know, the one meets the, the good looking guy, that type of stuff. So, so upon getting the interrupt, the first thing the nurse is going to do is she's going to put a bookmark in the book so that she knows what page to go back to. 
Now, if you hit the pause button on YouTube video, that's the equivalent. You know, you know, you, you've kept your place on the video. If you minimize your Facebook page, you can pop it back up and go back to your Facebook page. But you have to keep track of what you were doing right there. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to push the registers onto the stack. The stack is a place of memory that just magic that we, we, we set up our stack pointer someplace and we set up some memory for it and it contains all this information right there. And this is all done automatically. We push a stack pointer on the program counter onto the stack and then we push the registers. Then we go back and we execute our code right there. The code that is executed is pointed to by the interrupt service vector. We'll talk about that later, but we're going to execute these interrupt service routine code. At the end of our interrupt service routine, there's a command called RTI, R-E-T-I, return from interrupt, and that tells the microprocessor that we're done servicing this routine. Now, in the case of the nurse, the you know, fusion pump has you know, been refilled, a new bag of uh, plasma has been hung from it or whatever medicine that they're giving the patient. If the patient called for a sandwich, the, the sandwich has been ordered and delivered, whatever occurs, we service the interrupt service routine right there. Now, as a programmer, you would write the interrupt service routine. You know, this is a relatively short course. We really don't get into time to do that, but you need to understand this process. Then we pop the registers back from the stack. Remember, last in, first out, right? The, first, the last thing we popped, pushed onto the stack was the registers, so the first thing we pop out is the registers. It's done in reverse order. If we push them in R0 through R7, we're gonna pop them out R7 through R0 in reverse order. So keep in mind that this is in reverse order. Last in, first out, right there. And then we pop our programmer back to off the stack, and then we continue back to where we were at. So this is the execution flow for an interrupt, right there. So definitely, definitely, I can, I can even go as far as saying it that I can guarantee you that there's a question there and it's probably worth almost five, 10 points where you know this table. <laughs> so <laughs> that's there. I really, really point out that you need to, to know this flow chart. That's there. Okay. Now we're getting into some details and I'm gonna tell you right now that I'm, the final exam doesn't have any of these details. So as I'm going through this, if you want to ignore this part of the discussion, it's not going to show. It's not going to affect your final. It will affect when you go out to work. Try to, try to do that. All right, we have four external interrupts. They're called interrupt zero, one, and six and seven. Those are tied to pins on the microcontroller if we set them up on the through the crossbar. You know, the crossbar is where we assign our I.O. pins right there. Remember, that's our interface because we only have a few. We have five timers. Now, our, our processor may have, I think, only has three timers. That's there. And then we have two serial port interrupts. So we have many, inter, you know, multiple interrupts that right there. So, but there, the, the reset is one of those. We'll talk about a few others at the end. Each interrupt has one or more interrupt pending flags located in the special function register. In other words, when it generates an interrupt, it sets a flag that's there. there. When a peripheral external means a valid interrupt, the associated interrupt pending flag is set to one. They're level sensitive, which means that there, you normally would clear the interrupts that's there. Now, one of the thing, another question is gonna pop up and we'll get to that there is that some interrupts we can disable and others we cannot disable right there. And they're called maskable and non-maskable interrupts. Maskable interrupts means we can ignore them. 
patient in room 229, for example, keeps hitting his call button because his pill's rough and he's not happy with his pillow, you know, I think the nurse after a while is going to quit coming down to his room out there. They're going to start ignoring that out there. So we have every interrupt in the system has a location in memory associated with it. It's called the interrupt vector. And that tells it what code, where the where the processor is going to go when that interrupt occurs. Reset is our highest level interrupt. It's top order priority. That's there. And whenever the reset line is taken low, the processor is going to go to memory location 0000. zero, zero, zero. That's why we had in our code org zero, and we said long jump to me right there is so that upon reset, it would actually execute the code that we wanted. We have different interrupts, and if we're going to use those interrupts, we have to place in those locations the, the interrupt service routine. Now, that's taken care of for a large part the way we write our code, but we're not going to get into that there. In this class, we don't have enough time to do a lot of projects with interrupts. That's there. I've used interrupts a lot. But as we can see, we've got the reset, the external interrupt, the timer overflows, the external interrupts, timer overflows, UR, timer overflows, serial peripheral bus. We have our ADC window comparator, programmable array. We have many, many different types of interrupts that occur. External crystal oscillator ready, There's that's an interrupt routine right there, for example. So any of these can generate an interrupt right there. So the takeaway is you need to know what is meant by an interrupt vector. That is the location the processor goes to when that interrupt occurs, right there. That is the location. It's not shown here, but that's the location of this ICR code. That here is pointed to by the interrupt vector table. This is a V, vector table. This is the location of the interrupt service routine, is, is that location right there. So we need to go to that location right there, right there. So, and this is, these are the locations of the various interrupt vector tables. This is the interrupt vector table right there is what it is. And notice that it's the top part of memory. That's why we can't put anything, any code at the beginning. We can't just stick, start writing our code at location zero, zero. We have to do a long jump to someplace else in memory because everything after that's the interrupt vector table if we use other interrupts. <coughs> There's a version of Blinky that uses the timer interrupt up there, and I'll show you that example here. There, there. So in the event of two simultaneous interrupts, the priority is going to that there. It's very rare that you're going to have two interrupts that are occurring at the same time, right there. So I'm not worried too much about that. Disabling and enabling, I'm not going to go through a lot of that there, but we do have this cup at their programmable interrupt vectors at their fixed priority, pending interrupt flags. So I'm not going to get there. The external, I'm not going to go through that in great detail. But there, these are the timers. I'm not going to go through those. Right there, you can see we've got all kinds of various information there. So that's really the key thing that I wanted to go through on the interrupts right there. Now, one, one other thing that you need to know, and it's not necessarily in the slide there, right there, it's not these slides, but you will be defined to, to talk about a maskable versus a non-maskable interrupt, right there. Those are two different types up there. A maskable means essentially that we can ignore it. We can disable it. Non-maskable means 
it is always process right there. Now the 8051 doesn't have that many non-match flow interrupts. Reset's the only one that comes off the top of my head. All the other interrupts we have to individually enable. That there, we have to set them up. Other processors have non-match flow interrupts. That's there. But you need to know the difference between the two. And the very simple difference is a mass flow interrupt, we can say in software, it can be ignored right there. Non-maskable, you can't ignore it. You know, a patient, a patient in room 229 that keeps complaining about his pills uncomfortable, you can ignore him, right? That there. And most nurses probably would ignore that patient after the fifth trip down to that room in an hour, right? That there. But in the patient in room 230 next door that's on a heart rate monitor, when that thing sends out an alarm, you probably shouldn't ignore that one, right? You know, that's when they get the paddles out and, you know, jump start, you know, you know gives, gives the guy a jump start out there. So there are maskable, non-maskable and maskable, you know, in the, in the real world. You know, it's for example, an interrupt might be your gas gauge is running low. You look at the gas gauge, it's flipping, flashing on you, and it says you've got 100 kilometers before you run out of petrol. Well, you start to, you, know, you, you can ignore that one for a while. When, it, when it's flashing and it's got the line line, means that you're intimately running out of petrol, you probably shouldn't ignore that anymore, right there. So you've got those as our type of interrupts up there. So with that said, I will see everyone this afternoon, I guess, out there. Uh, I'll be real honest, I probably, let's see, is there anything else? Let me look at the final again. I may talk a little, have a couple other topics I want to hit before we jump into this project this afternoon. Out there. We want to get, because we've got only, this is our last week, isn't that correct? So anything that's not covered this week, and it's on the final exam, well, I've got a problem, so, I, so anything I cover this week is very important right there. And I did post that, that question. I, I have not looked yet, but I posted right there. And I'm not gonna pull it up now. I'll pull it up this afternoon and kind of go through those questions a little bit. You're supposed to turn those in by this, third, by this Wednesday, right? Did I give you a due date on that? You have a due date this Wednesday. You have to turn in that practice test right there. And then after you turn that in, I will go through the answers of that there. And again, I wrote that after I wrote the final. So a lot of the questions are very similar. I changed almost every question, some, but they're very similar right there. So uh, we will go through that and spend probably Wednesday more or Wednesday afternoon probably talk a little bit about that the last half last hour up there. Up there. So all right, with that said, how am I on time today? I probably I think I, I went about an hour. But oh an hour and fifteen minutes. My normal is about an hour and fifteen minutes. You can tell that my previous campus we were programmed for seventy five minute lectures. You know, once I hit seventy five minutes I'm done. <laughs> that there. And as I look around the room, most of you are pretty close to done after 75 minutes, too. 